I'd like to call the meeting to order. Yep. Oh, thank you. You want to ask us to please rise and salute the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This is what you call a select audience. <laughs> yeah. We'd like to thank you for coming, those of you that are here, uh, for sure. I'm going to go right now to a treasurer's report, Harvey. Okay. Very brief treasurer's report, not a whole lot of activity. But we started the month off with $2,413.68, which included $2,401.12 in the bank and $12.56 in petty cash. We collected $20 in dues, and we collected, uh, I'm sorry, and we spent $1,121.93 for the High Five Luncheon. We collected from the High Five Luncheon about $1,575, so we had a net gain of about $454. The balance on hand as of today is $1,299.19 in the checking account and $12.56 in the petty cash account for a to grand total of $1,311.75. Thank you very much. Do we have questions for our treasurer? If not, I would ask for approval. So, second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, okay, you're up, Berkeley. Secretary's report. Okay. Um, first of all, the minutes of the meeting of December 6, 2022, the High Fives meeting. They were distributed with the December newsletter. Are there any questions or additions, subtractions, complaints? Uh, otherwise, we have a motion to approve them as circulated. Motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Approved. Thank you. Okay. Uh, at the moment, we have 58 members paid up. Uh, we don't know where they are. Uh, I believe they've simply uh, uh, not made a proper note in a calendar. And maybe I should have sent a message around. The end of the year is always frantic, but I didn't. I uh, had other things going on. But we'll try. I Erica, think you're forgiven, and you can still remain as our, as our secretary, okay? <laughs> yeah, I just, fi just filed the... November and December newsletters for this year, which uh, the file now in the in our closet is available <laughs> as eight years of newsletters. Mm -hmm. And somebody else could take over any time they feel like. <laughs> <laughs> um, Good luck with that. I do think that by getting our members to attend the meetings, and we've got some wonderful speakers that uh, we've had that we're lining up. Bill Winter's done a great job, and he'll talk about that. Uh, and, and they ought to come and, and, and see and hear them. Um, I'm working on a brochure, uh, which is a project that's been going on for about three years, and have it pretty well mapped out the way I think it ought to be with the language. And we're trying, we're going to hope that Bruce and, and Bill and I can look at uh, some pictures that I've got on a thumb drive after the meeting because what we need now is the pictures and then we'll go to the high school. They printed our brochure the last two times that it was done and I'm uh, confident they will do it again uh, this year. So we hope to have that uh, perhaps in a matter of uh, weeks or a month or two, uh, and uh, that's that. The um, other next item I have is that uh, the uh, the trip this month to the 
uh, it's going to be a, no a lunch at Wimpy's restaurant on two weeks from today, the 17th of January at noon. I've got a sheet here to be sent around to sign up, and uh, we can consider whether at such a lunch we can have a discussion about some priorities facing the club and how we attack them. And certainly getting members to, to come to the meetings, they've paid their 20 bucks, uh, they might as well come to the meetings and enjoy them and the fellowship. And we try and do that. Uh, lastly, I think at this point is uh, that I'm inclined to put in the newsletter this uh, this month, which will go out. Uh, it'll be dated Friday. Well, yeah, Friday. Hopefully, get it done Friday or Saturday. Uh, so I, I noticed about just sort of sending the. Uh, good uh, sending best wishes to some of the members who are unable to attend meetings. Uh, I'm thinking of, uh, I have names of uh, Doug Moore, who is one of our oldest uh, original members, who is uh, unable to travel. And uh, another friend, Bill <coughs> Turner, who is a wonderful guy. Uh, is unable to, and they, he and his wife have moved from Southport uh, to a continuing care place further away, so he, he won't be redoing his membership next year. But it's nice to try to keep in, in touch with some of these folks, and so if you have any uh, names that should be added to that list and can get them to me by email, uh, between now and Friday, we'll make sure they're in the in the newsletter, and uh, which goes to everybody, and they'll know that we're thinking about them. He's turned. He just turns ninety two. Who? The gentleman you're speaking about. He's going to be ninety according to the church. Who? Bill, Bill Turner. Turner. Yeah, Bill Turner. Yeah. No. Oh. Bill. Well, it's a child, you mean? Child. Yeah. yeah. He's a child. He'll be ninety this uh, soon. <laughs> ninety. One of our younger members. Oh, to be 90 again. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, the end. One thing I'd like to add is that there's going to be an open house held by the Senior Center on the 31st of uh, January. And uh, certainly Berkey, Berkeley, hopefully, and I, and Bill, and anyone else who wants to be there could help to be there uh, to kind of uh, talk to any uh, guests who come through about men's club and it was our activities and hopefully we can try to encourage some membership at that event because they, I assume they'll have a number of people coming in. They sure have a lot of dancers and so on here but uh, hopefully we'll get some people stimulate some interest by doing that. I think that's the 31st of January uh, from about 9.30 to 11.30 or 9 to 11 but whatever that is. We'll, we'll, we'll nail that down. Thank you. I'd like to move over now to uh, Bill for uh, programs and trips. Okay. Okay. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Bruce. <clears throat> we, we've been filling out the calendar for the coming year, and when you're finished with your meeting here, come up and take a look at the calendar. We have the entire year here, and we're trying to fill in the various different holes. And then below that, we have what we put together as potential trips that people may be interested in. So as the meeting goes on, think about where you might like to go this year and come up after the meeting and see if it's listed here as a potential tour site. And if it isn't, feel free to write it in and then we'll send out all the possibilities to the entire membership and have them ranked and see what places people would like to go to. So this will be right here in front. Take a look at it. We have things set up for the rest of January. We have the tour of the uh, restaurant at Wimpy's coming up. And then in February, we have Joe Eukna from the Cape Cod Military Museum coming. He's going to be talking about the events that happened here on Cape Cod that helped win World War II. 
So that should be an exciting talk. And then Burke has set up a tour of Mashpee High School later in the month in February. So after that, we're just working on places to go. Think about where you'd like to go and make sure you write it on the list here. And something that we talked about at the last meeting is that oftentimes when we go places, we'll have pictures on our phone, but we need a way to share them with one another. So we have set up an account on Cluster, which is no charge, but everybody here will be getting an invitation to be able to go on to that site and see the various different photographs that we have taken as part of Mashpee Men's Club. So I put on a bunch of photographs a while back, and then I went back on, downloaded a picture from Mass Maritime, and I cropped it and printed it. So here it is right here. So everybody in the club will be able to share photographs and download whatever pictures you might like and print them up if you want. So th this was a, yeah. a print from Mass Maritime. You can Excellent. pass that Excellent. around. Excellent. That's beautiful. Picture. And if your printer has run out of ink or isn't working and there's a picture that you see that you would like, let me know. And I'll print it out for you and have it at the next meeting for you. Good. Good. Bill, yeah. can you get that Wimpy's thing going around mm -hmm. the... Sure. Is oh, it, uh, we, I think we already passed it off. Huh? Yeah, we Wimpy's already passed it off. Oh, it's already yeah. been? Yeah. It's uh, on its way. Oh, yeah. oh okay. Well, Circulating. I thought that was a copy of it. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Bill. You really uh, do a great job. He's joined us recently. He's really uh, taking the bull by the horns here, and we're really uh, moving in terms of programs. In terms of thank you, Mr. Maloney. Mm -hmm. Yes. Holy you can't yes. Go ahead. No, I can't do it. Uh, yep. 17th. Can you no, I can't do Can I download it? You, you can also. You okay. can share your pictures with everyone, it. too. And in fact, yeah, you can I even can. put captions in there okay. if you want. Yep. Do we have other questions for Bill or anyone here? Uh, yes. Bill, 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 is there any possibility of putting out a little bit of a tutorial on how to use Cluster? Oh, yes. I will send something out to everyone to uh, how, how to do it. It's extremely easy. I'm Even sorry. I can do it. <laughs> and <Okay. clears throat> there's just a couple little pointers, like when you first go on, just sort everything chronologically, then all the pictures will show up as they should versus time, and they'll all be grouped together. And it's, it's really, really simple to put pictures on, to take pictures off, and like I said, to crop them, print them, whatever you'd like to do, because we all have pictures that we'd like to share with one another. So you're going to, you're going to send it something out? So we can I, I, will, I will be sending out that invitation oh, in the well. near future to everyone. Thank you. Yep. So at this point in time, we're going to ask Berkeley to introduce our speaker, please. Yeah. Dr. Ernie, and Dr. you come up here, please. Uh, uh, or whatever, where you, wherever you're more, more, the most comfortable. Over here. Yeah. Okay. All right. uh, <clears throat> there ought to be an obligation to remove ticket uh, pictures you put on there that become obsolete or unnecessary or whatever will have yeah. thousands of pictures on there. Well, my, my thinking is that it would be nice to have a chronology of what the club has done over the years. I, I you know, I don't know if there's a limit of how many pictures we can have on it, but I, I don't, it, personally, a, I don't mind having old pictures on there, but we can talk I, about it. If, yeah. The question is whether you have to go through yeah. all the old ones to get to any... New ones. No, you can sort them according to chronology and look at the latest pictures first. Okay. A, a, f a funny thing happened to me this morning on the way to the forum. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was coming a week early to check this, this deal here, this. And somebody said something about, oh, you're here to, to talk. <laughs> Fortunately, I was a little early, and I turned pale. <laughs> and I said, well, I was just here to check the, the, the laptop and the flash drive to see if everything was working, which we were still doing, as you can see, into the last moment. So 
what the heck? And I dashed back home to get the talk that wasn't quite prepared, but, but uh, the slides are here, and I'm here, and you're here, and it's a small crowd, but I used to teach small crowds from four, from four to about 1,200. And when I had four and they were supposed to be six, I used to say, well, all the important people are here. Yeah. That also goes for this morning. And that's, yes. that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm going to do a lot of reading because I'm not quite as organized as I was going to be. <laughs> and otherwise, I'll take two hours if I don't do a lot of reading. I know you don't want that. So... Uh, you know, title, wonderful, wonderful mosquitoes. I know you don't think of it that way, but they are in a, in a way, and I'll show you. And biology and control, then and now, that's history. Now and then, that's ec economics and politics. So let's get it rolling. Uh, I want to, mosquitoes are considerably more complex than we give them credit for. Since, since I had this forum problem, I don't have a, 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 an accessory show tool to, that I would have brought, but so you're going to have to use your imaginations a tiny bit for this. Now, all of us have gone to either, you know, McDonald's or somewhere else and gotten one of these soft drinks with the plastic cap on top, and you take a straw and you want to do it, put it in there, and uh, you find that that's kind of hard. <laughs> Even though they have a spot where it's supposed to go in, it doesn't necessarily go in, right? And you go and you poke it and the straw bends. <laughs> and that doesn't work. And eventually you, re you remember that if you hold the straw way down at the bottom <laughs> to stiffen the short end, you can poke it through the top and there it goes. So the mosquito uh, can't reason all this out. But here's a beautiful mosquito. This is Aedes albopictus. They call it the tiger. Uh, it's an interesting, interesting on a number of counts, but, but I want to make one point with this mosquito right now. Up here is a complex that we call the proboscis. It's a nose, you, you know, and it has several parts encompassed in some palps, these long things here. And, and in the center is a siphon. And the siphon is our little straw that I just spoke about. And it's a tiny, thin little thing. And it has the same problems that we do. But the mosquito has a secret method for this. The siphon is an sheathed inside the palps. But for this job, the palps let it come out and grab it. The palps have two. There are two palps. Grab it by the tip like this and feed it in from the short end. So it gets through our skin and it can sip, sip blood and you can actually see a little reddish thing there that this, uh, this mosquito is feeding, slurping it up. And uh, they, if you look at it in an abstract sense, it, it, you, I mean, you can say, ugh, or you can say, it's kind of pretty. You know, it's got all these nice white, white, white on black and, and uh, striped legs. And so mosquitoes can be kind of pretty if you let them be pretty. Okay, so they have one more thing. They, they have an anticoagulant, and they secrete the anticoagulant in the siphon and slip it into you before they start to drink. And it hangs around the entrance and, and uh, so the siphon doesn't get clogged up. And you, the, the anticoagulant is a kind of a protein and it can stimulate uh, antibodies to be made against it. So you start making antibodies against the coagulant. <laughs> 
and and uh, after you've been bitten a couple of times, you you've got boosters. <laughs> you know, every time the mosquito bites you, it puts in the anticoagulant. Every time that happens, you're making <laughs> antibodies, and you start to itch, and the itch is the is the allergic reaction <laughs> that you make to this. So. The mosquito can do a lot of, th a lot of things. They're, they're more complicated than we think. Now, uh, OK, so let me go on. There are more than 4,000 species occupying any habitat that, that you can imagine that has water, even temporarily. They can obtain plant juices for food. But the females usually, mostly, need blood meal to produce eggs. So the females will sip plant juices, saps, and, and rotting fruit, and stuff like that. But the females generally also have to have that blood meal, because the juices are mostly carbs. And uh, if you're going to make eggs, you've got to get some proteins and some lipids in there. You're not going to get a good deal of that out of the sap. So the blood meal, that's where the good stuff in the, in the eggs comes from. So they can be, there are even females that violate this rule more a little later. They can be choosy in who they bite. And some species bite mammals, some birds or reptiles, frogs, even fish. Some bite in the treetops, but not at ground level unless you chop down their tree. Then they'll bite you and perhaps transmit yellow fever virus to you, which have, they've picked up from the monkeys up in the tree. And now you bring the tree down and the mosquito down and says, what the heck? Maybe this is a monkey too. They're all night, night biters, dawn and dusk biters, and some that bite you all day long. Some sneak up and bite your ankles. Others bite you most any place they can penetrate with their delicate siphon. They can be choosy about where they lay their eggs, on the water surface, on moist soil beside the water, in tree holes, even in the carnivorous pitcher plants where other insects fall in and die, they, one species of mosquito can lay its eggs in there and the larvae will survive and metamorphose and eventually come out as an adult mosquito. They may even have strange symbiotic relationships. One tropical rainforest species on the trunk of the meets lands on a tree trunk in the tropical rainforest, and there meets a species of ant. This is a particular species of mosquito and a particular species of ant. These are the only ones that do this. When an ant comes along and the mosquito has landed there, the mosquito waves its antennae and its palps at that ant, the ant stops, regurgitates, and the mosquito sips up the regurgitate as, as a meal. <coughs> Absolutely astonishing stuff. Unbelievable stuff, except that at least three mosquito workers have recorded this as actually happening. So it, it does happen. Uh, they can be quite pretty, as I've pointed out, black and white, and even with, uh, let me see if I have, let's see now. Oh, look. Now, the meal is, is pretty, almost completely taken in here now. And uh, if you ever had occasion to get one over there and all absentmindedly bang, damn, and you see a splat of blood on you, that's your blood. <laughs> OK, so at, at the Smithsonian, as I said, there's like 4,000 species from everywhere. At the Smithsonian, they, 
have them all mounted on these tiny pins and glued to the tiny, tiny pieces of paper and identified. And uh, all mosquitoes, <laughs> they have a, a million four hundred thousand specimens of just mosquitoes. So let's see what I've got here. Here's the, some of the pretty stuff. Just as pretty as, just as pretty as butterflies, some of them. They have iridescent colored, this is a thorax of a mosquito. And uh, the same mosquito that has blue, uh, blue legs. <laughs> Who knew? This mosquito, incidentally, is called the commonly an, an elephant mosquito, is sitting on a flower. I've got another picture of it somewhere along the line. In this particular species, the female does not need a blood meal. They do everything you can imagine. So why control mosquitoes? Well, they're a nuisance. You know, damn, <laughs> that's why you control them. That's incidentally, that's mosquito control then, right? The, the first step <laughs> of man controlling mosquito. <laughs> and uh, they, they can transmit viruses and, and protozoans. And there is uh, also the economic act aspect. There's a famous situation in New Jersey where there's so much salt marsh along the coasts that had very little habitation or use because the salt marsh mosquito was so terrible, so many, so many of them. And, so, and, and they get carried on the wind and can go inland too. So when they figured out how to deal with them, well, that was of a great economic value because the whole Jersey coast became tourist stuff, you know. And losses to farmers and breeders through transmitting diseases. And in areas, in some areas, the mosquitoes are in such clouds that they drive the animals and birds crazy. You know, they're, they're all upset and run around and, and, and just don't do well. So there are, there are various reasons. Well, we, carriers and vectors, it's complicated. Viral diseases like yellow fever, dengue, chikungunya, which we've heard about lately, Zika, which we've heard about lately, eastern equine encephalitis with scares that you've all grown grown up with that. West Nile virus, which we've heard about lately. All of this stuff is mosquito transmitted viruses. Uh, prot protozoan diseases, malaria, the worst killer of, uh, of, of people in the world of insect-borne diseases is, is malaria. Fortunately, mostly tropical, but not altogether. In in colonial times, you had yellow fever and malaria. You had yellow fever breakouts in, in Philadelphia. And there was a big uh, control in the, in the 30s and 40s an attempt to el eliminate Aedes aegypti, the major vector of malaria. And they did a hell of a job of it. And then they said, well, OK, uh, enough of the budget to this. And now they're back all along the whole southeastern part of the United States and into the western, too, now. Uh, helminthic diseases, your dog heartworm is transmitted by a mosquito that lives in cattail marshes. Uh, and reservoirs that they can pick this stuff up with, well, they feed on all of those and, and we, they bring us bird diseases. A lot of these things are bird diseases. Okay, on we go. So there's Okay, mosquitoes have an interesting life cycle and live in buried habitats. Let's see what sur surprises this bring us. This brings us uh, the mosquito life cycle. 
the adult, the adult lives in the terrestrial world. The next cycle, I guess, will probably show this slide. Uh, so we have the adult mosquito living a terrestrial life. The eggs are laid on water or moist so soil, but they, met, they, they hatch into larvae over here on the right-hand corner. The larvae grow into four stages, which look pretty similar that usually feed on microorganisms in the, uh, you don't have to hide back there. You can move down, Jane, where you can see. I see her doing like this back there. It's, it's all right. They don't mind you being here. Uh, they get to the large stage here, and they've, they've been feeding on mostly microorganisms. They turn into a pupa. This would be a cocoon for a butterfly. That's that, the cocoon stage. At this point, there is a dramatic metamorphosis, re total reorganization inside this thing. And the next thing you know, uh, it emerges as an adult mosquito looking nothing like this cycle. How long does that process take? This process uh, varies, but is strongly dependent on temperature. Uh, in, uh, in the salt marsh mosquito in the summer, it can all happen in seven or seven days, six, seven, eight days, and they're, they're on their way. That's too bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in, in, in the Arctic areas where, where there's a lot of cold weather, this stuff is really slowed down, and sometimes the, the larval stage will stop at, at winter, and it will wait till it heats up in the, in the spring and summer again, and then the adult completes the cycle. Yeah? When you see the, the, these Alaskan television programs, you see all the mosquitoes around there? Oh, yeah. God. Going oh, there. yeah. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's like what the Jersey coast would have been like before drainage and stuff like that. Okay, let's see what else there is. So there's a blow up. You can see the brushy, it's brushy mouth parts here. This, they filter out the microorganisms. So the larvae pick this up and, and uh, this siphon up the, up the right hand corner, it hangs in the uh, surface tension of the surface of the water and, and the larva will just hang by that, pokes it into that surface tension and gets trapped in it and the larva hangs head down and filters from there's a lot of stuff in the surface there. And in fact, when you do, do one of the early mosquito controls, oiling was one. And oiling breaks up that surface tension of the water and they'll fall right off that. And then, the, and then they'll fall to the bottom and they'll go crazy and they'll try to go up again and try to stick the siphon up again and it won't stick and they go down. And, and so eventually they just exhaust their resources and, and die. It's very effective, but it could, could be messy in the old days with the oil. Uh, they still oil with some things, but they have a very light alcohol oil now that evaporates. So there's been a chemical advance in that, con in that context with that type of uh, control. Uh, so let's see, like I, s oh, okay, good. Uh, let's leap ahead to, to chemical control. It's organic. Uh, this Altacid this is a brand name, and look, it's bio-rational. This is an ad. <laughs> and, uh, and that's sort of what the molecule looks like. Uh, now, what this really is, is what they call a juvenile hormone. And the juvenile hormone is secreted by the mosquito larva. And as the larva grows and gets nearer to metamorphosis, the juvenile larva decreases somehow. The internal control is such that 
as it gets to a certain size, the juvenile har hormone drops off. And as that drops off, the thing metamorphoses into the pupa and the adult. So what they found was that they could apply the synthetic juvenile hormone to the water, and the larva s stays stuck because it, it, it uh, drinks some of the juvenile hormone. So even as internally it's trying to drop it off, it's keeping up, the larva is trapped eternally in the larval stage until it dies or it's eaten, you know. So that's one kind of control. And that's certainly an advance. It's not a great advance now, but it was a great advance when I was a graduate student, which as you can tell by looking at me was a long time ago. <laughs> so, so this is organic, right? So it must be OK. Because <laughs> if it's not organic, we know it's not OK. Yeah? What about fish? Yeah, the fish will eat them, yes, any time. They love them. And so uh, uh, the longer they spend their lives as a larva, the, the more likely that they're going to get eaten before they metamorphose. So this is a way of keeping them there for the predators to eat. And that's good. That's natural. <laughs> pardon, me, pardon me, my cynical side comes out. <laughs> Okay, so let's see what else. Okay, and so here's something else that's, look, you can use this over organic crops, so this must be organic too, right? Okay, what is this? This is a bacteria, and what they do, uh, these BTIs, what BTI stands for actually, and I won't say it again, is Bacillus thuringiensis variety Israelensis, because they found it in Israel, a, a variety of this species of bacteria. And the Bacillus genus produces spores, which is very bad in some cases for us, but is very good in this case because you can raise them, culture them, let them make spores. The spores can be dried and com uh, com included with a dust to distribute them, and then you can rain them out on the water. The spores will fall in the water. The, back the larvae will ingest the spores. The spores will hatch out into bacilli and the bacilli will reproduce inside the mosquito larvae and kill them. So what you're giving them is food poisoning. That's organic. So this is another advance beyond the old, the old stuff. OK. That's okay. Here's an adult emerging from the pupil case. Here's the pupil, this is the water surface. Here's the pupil case down here. And it's metamorphosed and it's coming out. You see its wings are not quite developed yet and it will pump, pump fluid, some of its own fluid into the, into the wings to spread them out. And then they tend to fly out into the grasses because their, their cuticles are very soft. They need to dry out otherwise and harden that cuticle. Otherwise, they, uh, evaporation kills them. The desiccation kills them right away. So here's some pretty ones <laughs> sitting in the grass, drying out, ready to take off. Beautiful black and white mosquitoes. This is Aedes tenurincus. This is, this is one that grows in the upland edges of the marsh, which, where there's uh, uh, fresh water diluting the salt water. 
So this is not the main salt marsh mosquito, but it's, it's a hell of a good biter too. Okay, what's coming up? The, oh yes, there it is, Toxorhynchides rutilus. This is the elephant mosquito. This is the one that doesn't have to bite you to lay eggs. It's terrific. And it's, it, it's drinking sap and you know, and you can see the bluish color there. This is the one I showed you the magnified portions of. It's, it's a big mosquito, like three quarters of an inch in, in that area. And uh, with these mosquitoes, typically the larvae grow very large. And the larvae apparently acquire more nutrients and, and I should make a point here, the larvae of these mosquitoes and of the Serophora genus are carnivorous. So the larvae are predators and they get a rich food source and store a lot of food within themselves and apparently the larvae store enough good, good uh, quality stuff to go into the adult so that the adult can lay eggs without the need of the blood meal. What do they feed on? It's carnivorous. Anything smaller than them, including their own brethren. <laughs> any, any small worm, anything soft enough, anything that attracts them, they, they have big mandibles and they go, you know. So the elephant mosquito on, on a flower. <laughs> okay, so we've, we've jumped into life traps. All right. I do, I do want to just tell you a little bit about uh, very quickly that about that life cycle that is kind of interesting. In an evolutionary sense, a broad, wonderful evolutionary sense, the fact that half the life cycle is terrestrial, it's not really half because the adult doesn't live as long as the larva usually. And the larva lives, they live on two, in two systems and feed in two separate systems systems, they don't compete with each other. They can use different resources. The adult drinks sap of, let's say, sap of flowers while the larva is feeding on microorganisms in the water. This means that in one area there is more sustenance for them because they're taking it at two levels. It's like what nomads do when they move, nomads generally live in arid regions where there's not enough, they're herders, and there's not enough rain to produce enough grass all year round, or, the, or there are periods of, of monsoons and drought, and so they are constantly on the move following the grass, which is what the, what the mammals do in the, in the savannas of, of Africa that people go to see and they follow the rain and the grass. And, and this is what birds do when they go north in the springtime to nest and then move down south somewhere when it's winter. So it's an interesting thing that, that this evolutionary uh, benefit has been acquired in different ways by different animals, birds, insects, <laughs> in different stra The mosquito doesn't have to go anywhere except around its pond. The bird has to go thousands of miles. So it's part of the wonderfulness of mosquitoes. <laughs> uh, so this is Tommy Mulhern. Uh, a, f a famous, a lot of stuff got done at Rutgers in, uh, in uh, the last century. The last century, geez, makes me feel old to say that. You know, <laughs> we're all creatures of the last century, aren't we? <laughs> uh, 
this guy invented a lot of stuff. And uh, what he has here is his light trap. This is called the New Jersey light trap. It was like a universal light trap in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. In the 60s, this is all metal and it's heavy. And in the 60s, the CDC, the much maligned CDC, uh, bu built a better light trap. It was lighter, it's easier to work with. But the basic thing about a light trap is, is it's got a light. <laughs> you know, and insects often go to the light, right? So it's got a light, it's got a fan, so if you come near the light, the fan sucks you in. There's a little box that you fall into or a little jar that you fall into and a guy comes around or a gal comes around and takes it into the lab and they sense us, they sense us. It's part of surveillance. You, surveillance, you have to know what's there, how numerous it is, and since the mosquitoes occupy different habitats, so you want to know which mosquito it is that, that is a problem. And so the light trap helps you do this. There are advances, I might add, to the light trap. They have put baits. CO2 is a good bait. And I used to have a picture of, of something that I'd show my students where somebody was running from a mosquito and the more you run, the more CO2 you exhale. <laughs> you know? uh, lactic acid also on the skin. And, and uh, so there's a variety of things, but CO2 is a, is a goodie. And, uh, uh, gravid mosquitoes need a different trap. Once they're fertilized, they're looking for a different kind of habitat, so they're looking for smelly water, water with nutrients in it. So you could put a little bait in and do a whole different kind of trap if you want to trap egg-laying mosquitoes. So there's Tommy Mulhern with this thing. They used to have to plug it in, then they got uh, running it on a car battery. You can imagine people hauling car batteries around and this big metallic thing. So this has all been very much improved. And uh, this was really the first generation of the modern bug zapper instead of collecting mm -hmm. the mosquito? Uh, well, not really, because the, the goal was not to zap bugs. It was to do surveillance. And, and it, the principle applies, yeah, and it's certainly it's a, bug, it's a kind of bug zapper, but, but it doesn't begin to zap enough bugs, neither do the bug zappers that they sell you begin to zap enough bugs to save you. It's attractive, but it doesn't. So, okay, I, I think I already said all of this stuff here. Okay, this is a little fuzzy here, but that's okay. This is the aggregate of five years trapping in New Jersey in the 30s. And there's, there's two things that I want, to, want you to see, is that a few species of mosquitoes, Aedes solicitans, Culex pipiens, Aedes vexans, and Cochlatidia perturbans, actually just the top three represent like 90, 99% of the, the total, total population. So surveillance tells you something about who's out there and, and, and how many, and Aedes solicitans is the salt marsh mosquito in the Northeast. <laughs> and these things are flyers, they'll get up with the breeze and so they'll come off the salt marsh. They, they sit at, as they sit in the grass for a day or two to dry out, but then, then they get active. And if there's a breeze that's going inland, they will land as far as 10, 15, 20 miles inland. So it's a big pest. Uh, Culex pipiens is, is uh, a trans, one of the transmitters of, of, of uh, West Nile virus. And this is your household mosquito, Culex pipiens. This is the one that, that uh, reproduces in containers around the house. So control 
one of the control things that is important is not to have larval habitats around the house. Aedes vexans is uh, char Aedes characteristically lay their eggs on moist soil. And Aedes solicitans does this. It Aedes vexans, though, lives in the woodland pools that are, that are wetted in the springtime or excessive rain, temporary pools. And that kind of thing you can throw juvenile hormone into or BTI spores. This one you can drain. This one you can drain. This one is very interesting, Cochlatidia perturbans, what a nice name. <laughs> There's quite a significant number of them, not to compare with this other thing, but they're interesting because they tend to be, you'll find them around farms, biting, biting the horses and biting, biting birds. The larvae live in cattail marshes. You know what people sometimes say, cat and nine tails. They're cattails and, and uh, with the punk on the top, you know. And these larvae have part of the wonderful mosquitoes. It, they don't hang in the water. They stick their siphons into the, the subaqueous sub parts of the stem where there is oxygen in the stem and they get their oxygen from the plant that is picking it up and the siphon of the, 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 its own circulatory system. And, and so cattails, cochlatidia perturbans, West Nile virus, dog heartworm. So it's not as numerous as these, but it certainly is a disease transmitter and one of the things that it does is it bites both birds and mammals. So that's, these are the ones that they call bridge vectors that some, some mosquitoes are very picky. They won't eat anything, but they won't bite anything but a, a frog. They wouldn't bite us for, a, for anything. But there are what they call bridge vectors that will by two different types of organisms, like a bird and a mammal. And this is the way we get mammal viruses from birds. Yeah? Does the female need more than one blood meal, or is she satisfied just with one meal? The females, the female mosquito can usually produce more than one batch of eggs from a blood meal. They can produce anywhere from 100 to hundreds of eggs from a blood meal. But if they live long enough, they may indeed take another blood meal. OK, where are we in this thing? So I have something here about control, you know, uh, controlling. Oh, yeah. So I already talked about this. Solicitans, Pipians, Vexans, and Cocklip. Here you can see, I know you want to know the names of these mosquitoes. So now you can, now you can read them clearly and be happy with that. Are we going to have an exam after this? There's a quiz. <laughs> OK, let's. Let's, Let's let, let that go. Mosquitoes and hope we see if we can live through it. Ernie, um, there may be a lot of questions. I don't know, but uh, if you could wrap up the presentation, maybe in ten minutes, it'll leave a little bit of time. We're ten minutes to, to finish. Okay, and leave to, a little time. Yeah. We're obligated to uh, adjourn by twelve o'clock. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> we'll do. We'll do. Despite everything, I'm going to manage that. <laughs> uh, okay, so drainage is one of, the, one of the ways of controlling. Obviously, if you can drain all the water out, the larvae can't live there. And so 
Uh, ditching is, is certainly a method, and this, is, th th this picture was taken, I don't have the whole picture, but this was taken around 1903 in New Jersey, and uh, this guy has got, see the blade here with the teeth? He's got a thing like this, and he drives it down around, and he cuts through the sod and cuts the patch that they're going to take. This guy has a shovel. He cuts under the patch, cuts the root off. This guy with the rake here, he pulls the thing off, and now they can dig out the rest of the ditch. Wow. And uh, from the early 1900s on, <laughs> this was the way to do it for a long time, and even now they do a bit of it, not, not digging like this, but they still do a little digging. Uh, but, but they also have, this is another uh, invention of Tommy Mulhern's. <laughs> he, he hooked up a caterpillar to something that, to something that grinds up the sod and casts out the sod over here. And this is an improvement, this is an improvement over the previous method because the previous method when they rake out the sod, the guy produces a whole pile of a, 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 a mini dike of sod beside the ditch. And sometimes you create new little pools behind the sod. So, so they figured out you've got to do something with that sod problem, uh, although it's a go good habitat for voles and mice. <laughs> what are you going to say? But there's Tommy Mulhern driving uh, Hercules number two in 1931. This is the clinking, clanking, clattering collection of collagenous junk that you hear about in the in the Liz, in the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Except that this is not junk; it's it it's functional. Today, these things are not like that anymore. Obviously, so machines have machines have developed is the message. But Mulhern developed an awful lot of stuff. Okay. Well, let's just, let's just go on with the slides. That's me a long time ago in, in New Jersey, and we're staking out quadrats, experimental quadrats here. And you can see one of these temporary pools. Uh, and this is, this is, you can see, it's like hay. This is called salt marsh hay commonly. It's a particular species. It grows around mean high tide in a marsh. And when you have the extreme high tides, the spring high tides, you overflow this area, and all the depressions fill with water. And when the water drains out with the low tide, with the tide withdraws, these little pools have been filled. And this is where the salt marsh mosquito does its job. All around those dry, dried out spots, it lays eggs. When they're flooded, the eggs cure. You dry, it doesn't kill them. And they need to be dried. Then it floods and the larvae develop and, and inside of a week, off they come. In New Jersey, they diked 13,000 acres of marsh to create more of this Peytens marsh that they would flood only occasionally, but which the high tides and the, and the rainstorms would flood, and this produced tremendous problems of mosquitoes. So, okay. What this is the, the lower end of the marsh where the tides get in every day. No mosquitoes are produced here. They should not be ever treated. They don't have to be treated. This is an old class here. I, I won't take the time to explain it to you, unfortunately. This is an overhead, overhead view which shows uh, some dikes. Here's a dike. This is a freshwater impoundment here. This is salt marsh that was treated by digging ditches. You see, see the straight lines? Old ditches from the WPA times. And they also, 
experimented with creating pools with the concept being that in the pools you would have predatory fish that would that could get out in through the ditches to the temporary temporary depressions and feed on the larvae there and then get back in the pools and survive so this is sort sort of shows a history a, a historical attempt to mix predatory with drainage on the experiment here is to put dikes around this whole area and this was all flooded completely. The idea there being that you fill it with carnivorous fish and remembering that these things lay their eggs only in moist areas, not in flooded areas, they wouldn't lay their eggs in this area 80s anymore. They had tremendous pumps to flood these things and uh, uh, the first flooding produces a tremendous belch of mosquitoes. <laughs> And then they don't lay their eggs around there anymore, and it works. Uh, still, this is, this is not really desirable. The marsh, the marsh has value, and all the grasses die when you flood the impoundments. But it was an, a popular thing to experiment with. Here's an impoundment that is partially flooded that doesn't work quite that well. There's, there are egrets out there, a small heron, and those things are the things that carry the viruses. So some, this doesn't work so well. But there were big fish in these things, and these guys are hunting them with bow and arrow. So <laughs> this, uh, this is a nice way to publicize it, you know, to show that the impoundments are good, and you get, you get use, multiple use, right, wildlife and stuff like that. That's an old fellow with his head cut off, Fred Farino, who helped me a lot. <laughs> Tires. This is one of the most dangerous and difficult problems in mosquito control. It rains, they're all little ponds, and you cannot, you cannot spray them effectively you just can't do it because they're all lying in every different direction. There's no really good way of controlling mosquitoes in these things except to get rid of these tire piles. And there's our old friend Aedes alvopictus, which came to this country on, in tires on the recapping trade from the Far East back to the States, and has dispersed itself, I think, into more than 40 of our states by now. And it is one of the things that will vector virtually all the viruses that we've been talking about. It's a real bad guy. Still sipping. A little picture of a bad pond situation. What's missing is there's birds up around the edge of this thing to make things worse. <laughs> and you have a stagnant pond where the fish can't get in at a tire and, you know, okay, bad news. All right, now we're into chemicals. Oh, then, arsenicals. Toxic, very long lasting. Pyrethrum from daisy petals, believe it or not. Unstable, harmless to humans. Flit, you remember flit? You remember having the little handle thing and you go around and do that? Uh, that was pyrethrum with a little kerosene to disperse it. Uh, nicotine, one of the most toxic uh, uh, molecules known to man, drops of it will kill you if you put it in somebody's eye, a couple of drops in the eye. Uh, ver but it's a botanical, right? <laughs> Can't be that bad. They used to use it in the gardens. Newer synthetics, organochlorines or chlorinated hydrocarbons, DDT, harmless to humans but long-lasting. 
and great stuff for killing insects, potato beetles, <laughs> great agricultural stuff. But concentrates in the food chains. Everybody heard about food chain poisoning, you know. I can't, I don't have the time to talk about that seriously, but there it is. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, they certainly did damage to eagles and pelicans and salmon and things like that. Harmless to humans, don't believe the baloney. Uh, there's a lot of data to support that. But banned since 1975, and uh, it's, it's had a good environmental benefit to do that. Uh, from this, oh yeah, flit. Quick Henry the flit. Do you remember the Henry cartoons, little bald Henry? This is painted by Theodore Seuss Geisel. Some of you know that that's Dr. <laughs> that's Dr. Seuss before he was Dr. Seuss, and he was making a living doing this. <laughs> Quick Henry the flit. Uh, uh, this was uh, the spraying aspect and the compounding aspect that was developed in New Jersey too. And that's pyrethrum, the flit. Okay, now the banning of DDT, the age of organophosphates, a different molecule derived from the same thing that uh, nerve gas was derived from. But there are some very harmless ones relatively to, to humans and birds, some very toxic, some very harmless, some have a short half-life. Pyrethroids, which are taken from the original, original pyrethrum from the daisy, there were multiple compounds. It was a mixed molecule, actually, and they isolated some of them and, and developed them, and they're being used today and they are more effective than the original pyrethrum, but less damaging than some other things. Neonicotinoids, as it sounds like, and it is, it's derived from nicotine. And it is much less harmful to mammals than nicotine, and has become a big agricultural benefit, but there's, they're toxic to insects. And uh, in Europe, where they've studied this, uh, they have actually banned nicotino neonicotinoids, although they are very effective. And, and they can insert it into the genetics of the plant. This is an advance in itself, the capacity to, to, to put the gene into a crop plant. Instead, nicotine comes from tobacco, right? It's, it's an organic, it's tobacco. You can insert it into corn or wheat, and they will secrete the neonicotinoid, and it'll kill the insects. The trouble is, is that there's cross-pollination sometimes. An insect will take, take uh, pollen from one of these plants and go off the field and go visiting other plants and pro transfer those neonicotinoids to weeds. <laughs> and so now the weeds have the defense <laughs> against the insects too. There's, it's a complex world is really what the fact of the matter is. Okay, all right, more viruses and bacteria. Well, yes, I told you about the BTI the insect juvenile hormones, they've tried nematodes. It's not practical. There are nematode parasites of the larvae, but it's not practical. Uh, the juvenile hormones, that's being used. So BTI, juvenile hormones, those are the more modern kind of things. Then the other things that have evolved are delivery methods. You saw the, uh, the clinking, clanking, clattering. This is a, an old Chevy, I think, 
this is a can of, of, of like you could say, flit. And this is the back end of it. Pump it right through the exhaust system <laughs> through the, and burn a fogging. And, and uh, uh, that's another thing that uh, uh, Cochrane developed. Uh, backpacking the mosquito way. <laughs> a very sophisticated mechanism. Uh, the guy is fogging, uh, fogging off a truck, spraying off a fixed wing, helicopter, bags of granules that you can deliver, and dusts. Filling a helicopter on top of, this is sitting on a truck. Everybody's sitting on a truck here is a tank of liquid spray. Drones. Ernie, we're going to have to wrap this up. Okay, uh, well, we are there. Yes. We are there. We've arrived. Okay. Uh, I just want to point out that, that they have developed nozzles that can uh, release uh, droplets of a size of 10 to 30 microns. A red blood cell is 6 microns, so a drop 10 microns is two, two red blood cells. This means that they can use produce a, a very fine fog and use very much lower fluid number uh, values of the pesticide. You can reduce it by a hundred times, more than a hundred times. You can go from using a gallon down to an ounce or less with these nozzles. And uh, you have all these ways of delivery, and they have all kinds of granule sizes, all kinds of drop sizes, and the GPS for guidance of applicators, and, and the drones for many applications. So the whole, the whole system from end to end has become more sophisticated. And uh, OK. Uh, Does anybody have a real burning question that you'd like to ask? Have we got it all yet? I know I've been answering questions all along, so yeah, I don't sure. feel guilty. What, what, I don't feel guilty how, about the question. How quest long does a mosquito live on its own without you squatting them? It depends on temperature and moisture of the air. In arid areas, it won't live it for very long, a week or two. Uh, maybe a, a, a month is a long-lived mosquito. Okay. Okay. And, you, and you mentioned in the life cycle, Fish feed on the larvae when they're in the water, and then when they're airborne, the birds feed on them as well. Yeah, anything that can catch them. Although they're not much of a blood meal, but they bats will will catch them. Birds will catch them. I I don't think that the bats or birds are very good mosquito control. Although people like to push put up purple martin nests and stuff like that, which can't do any harm. But most of the data regarding how much mosquitoes eat is done in, a, in, in, a, in an indoor lab with a lot of mosquitoes, <laughs> you know, and say, oh, they eat these things like crazy, but. Do we have other questions? If not, I'd like to thank Ernie very, very much. Uh, very complicated thank process, you. isn't it? Thank very you very much. much. Yes. You're welcome. I, well, I thought I would show you more than people expected to get out of this. <laughs> Were your students able to use abbreviations, or did they have to learn to spell all these things? It, it depends. <laughs> it, de it, it depends. Uh, uh, the, the Linnaean stuff is important, the, the, the Linnaean names, because everything in every group whatever plant or animal has common names, and the common names vary wherever you go. Right. And, and if you're going to do scientific work, you have to be able to communicate what you're working with to the rest of the gang. Yes. And, and if you say something like an elephant mosquito, which is a very vague kind of thing, uh, uh, 
this guy may be working on this and this guy's working on something else and over here they call it a, a, a rhinoceros mosquito or something. So we give them technical names and the, the literature registers these names and pe people can communicate with each other. So it's not just that we relish these names, it's that you really need to know. Otherwise you can't communicate your d data and compare your data and your lab experiments with other people. Thank you very, very okay, much. Ernie, uh, thank you. I'd like to move for adjournment and we're going to have a raffle. As well, do a little second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much.